Hey everybody, thank you for being here for this. And um, I'm really honored to be here, to be honest with you. I say that at all my speaking events, but in this case it's got the added benefit of being true. So <laughs> truth is a really important concept. And um, it's, I think part of the reason we're all here is because we, we have an understanding that the media on which we rely on for our truth is not exactly delivering the goods and is not incentivized to do that in the first place. So I wrote this book and published it in 2021. Oh, sorry. And um, the book was about the New York Times. The New York Times is, I would say, by far the most powerful media brand in the world. It is pound for pound the most powerful media brand. And, and over the course of the last 100 years, it has gotten the story so wrong as to alter the course of history in those cases. So just before I dive into the kind of whirlwind tour uh, of the book, I'll give you a little bit of a history, a little story about how the book came into being, which is sort of reflective of where we are today. It's two media states. And the first media state was when I went to publish this book, I got to a very, very powerful agent, book agent, through some contacts of mine. And the book agent just flat out told me no. Why? Because he didn't want to risk offending the New York Times, of course. The most powerful tool in all of publishing is the New York Times bestseller list, and he was not going to risk all his other clients for some schlub from Tel Aviv at the time. So I got to know. It wasn't about the quality of the work. It wasn't about the ideas. It wasn't about the facts. It wasn't about anything to do with that. Fast forward 15 years. I put the book in a drawer. 15 years later, I went to publish it. Had enough. Published by myself. And then I DM'd Balaji after hearing him on Tim Ferriss one day. And the answer I get was the polar opposite of the book agent. It was, hell yeah. It was, this is great. And I think that's reflective of the gatekeeping that we have in publishing and in traditional media, and the very opposite that we have in the new media that is now emerging. So just to give you a little sense of what this book is about, we start with, uh, chronologically, this was Holodomor. That's the Ukraine famine. So this is sort of a reflection of what we're seeing today in Russia and Ukraine, where the Soviets, Stalin namely, tried to starve uh, Ukrainian peasants into submission, killed somewhere between five and the upper range is about 10 million people, and the New York Times denied it. The New York Times didn't say that there was uh, not, it didn't just say that there was not a famine, it denied the reporting of other people that did say there was a famine. And we sort of know about this as Walter Durante, who was the guy who was the reporter for the New York Times in Russia, and he got a lot of the blame for this, but it never really made sense to me why he would say there's nothing going on here. Reporters don't like to say nothing doing. They like to say there's a big deal here and everyone should come check it out. What actually happened is that Durante was part of an effort that was assisted by the New York Times to broker American recognition of the Soviets. And when that happened, as we can see in the, this, this text down here, there was a big gala event. When it finally did happen, Durante actually advised FDR to do that diplomatic recognition. He was the only person in a room of 2,000 people to get a standing ovation, because everybody in that new room understood that without Durante denying this famine, there was no chance the Americans would ever recognize the Soviet regime if it had just killed five million of its own people for, nothing, for no, no reason, no re for no purpose. So we have the Nazis, the New York Times, that man up there on the top left was the New York Times bureau chief in Berlin in the lead up and during World War II, was a Nazi. Was a Nazi sympathizer, was a Nazi collaborator. He published stories in, in his bureau when they called the Berlin Olympics, the Nazi Olympics, 1936, is the greatest sporting event of all times. So this was a games where Jews were not allowed to participate. The New York Times pretty much cooperated with the Nazis because it got them good access. It got them top access. It got them to be number one, and that's what the New York Times really cares about. Cuba. We have here Herbert Matthews was the correspondent in Cuba, and he basically resurrected Fidel Castro from the dead. Castro was all but gone, irrelevant. Nobody cared about the guy until this front page story and a series of front page stories in over the following months pounded the notion that this was a democratic messiah for the Cuban people. Whether or not he was actually a democratic figure was never investigated, it was just asserted. It was just told to people until there was enough momentum to actually have that revolution succeeded. And there we have this quote where we have, Matthew's work was more important to the rebels than a victory 
on the battlefield. That's from Che Guevara. The atom bomb, the New York Times, and this is one of these sort of, it's not a gray area, it's out and out propaganda. The New York Times collaborated with the Department of War to deny the fact that there was radiation poisoning as a result of the atomic bombs dropped on Japan. They had implanted, they, they sort of uh, had their reporter, the top science reporter, a guy named William Lawrence, go out on loan to the War Department. They got him access to the uh, Manhattan Project. So you've got the most secret project, military project, in the entire United States, and there's a reporter there. Why? Because he was writing pamphlets for the War Department denying that there was such a thing as radiation poisoning. And there you see with Oppenheimer, General Leslie Groves, and William Lawrence standing there checking it out. Iraq War, of course, we've heard Glenn just talking about 9-11 and the aftermath for the security state. Well, what got us into it was the New York Times telling the world, yes, Saddam Hussein had WMD and was pursuing weapons of mass destruction, namely nuclear, and they had this big push. Front page stories, Judy Miller was one of the main or if not the main journalist pushing this. We get these stories like USS Hussein intensifies quest for A-bomb parts. Judy Miller, who reported that story, never actually met some of the most important sources to that story. She saw some of these people at a distance, and they kind of waved at her, and she said, okay, check, that story's corroborated. Why? Because the man on the bottom left, Howell Raines, was the head of the New York Times at that moment, and he wanted to increase what he called the competitive metabolism of the newspaper, meaning, be number one at all costs. And the cost, once again, was truth. And then we have the 1619 Project, more recently, where the New York Times takes it upon itself to redefine American history, framing it from one of liberty to one of slavery, which is all very well. Everyone's entitled to their perspective. The problem with the 1619 Project is that it's based in part on historical lies. They asserted things that are not true, that their own fact checkers told them were not true in order to ram this thesis home. And that is what they did where they got children's books, they got podcasts, they got a show with Oprah coming up. And again, this is about implanting a narrative. It's not about finding the facts and it hasn't been for a long time. I think this is one of the things people really don't understand about the media today, which is it's not that it evolved to this place where it is sort of corrupt and implanting narratives upon people. It kind of always was that, and we're just waking up to the realities of it. And that's something we can see with uh, crowning the crypto emperor. So, you know, we, saw, we all saw the magazine covers of Forbes and Fortune, and that made a big splash. But for years, for two years, up until that point that this all blew up, the New York Times was really just milking this notion of SBF as this altruist with fuzzy hair and funny clothes. And that's what they did. Instead of investigating him, instead of looking at the financials, instead of asking who's on the board of this company, they ran these kinds of stories nonstop. And that's how we got to where we were. And finally, we have here the New York Times as a dynasty. And that's really what it is. It's the last American dynasty. It's a great dynasty. It goes back 100 years. And the current publisher is named Arthur Sulzberger. The one before him was named Arthur Sulzberger. The one before him was named Arthur Sulzberger. And the one before him was named Arthur Sulzberger. And it's like the Mr. Sulzberger of the media matrix. They pop out everywhere. It's just the next Sulzberger. And mind you, of course, they're all white men. They don't like to talk about that fact, but that is true. So we're seeing a shift in media. What we're seeing is the current model where we have the reporter at the center of the action, event, reporter. Is it news? Is it not news? The reporter makes a decision, goes out to the people. And I think the next model, what we'll be seeing is an event happens, there's some analysis, there's data collection, people, audiences get it. And then if a reporter wants to talk about it, sure, why not? Um, that's an important shift. We saw this recently with people deconstructing the infamous New York Times story about Bitcoin mining, where they kind of made a, made a picture of the mine look kind of fuzzy. Someone correct, showed that if you actually corrected what they implanted on it, you get a very different picture. Um, and we're also seeing great stuff, Richard Chen exposing some of the SBF, FTX stuff on Twitter, some of the stuff from Community Notes, where Reuters reports or misreports stuff about Tesla delivery estimates, 
Community Notes actually corrects some financial reporting in a very important way. And I think this is really what it's all about, is that reality has been centralized by the media for so long that we've lost sight of the fact that it should not be determined by fiat, by somebody declaring it to be so, but by consensus. This is the moment we're at. This is why the network state is such an important concept. Thank you very much for being here and for listening to me.